Good morning. How are you guys doing? Doing well? Good to see you guys. You guys can stand up. And let's pray before we get started. Let's bow our heads. Dearly Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you, God, for you. Thank you for your glory, God. And thank you for your sacrifice. And that's why we're here, because of your love, God. And I just pray that as you filled us with your love and that as you continue to show us that love, I pray, God, that we can show you that love back to you right now as we worship, as we bow down, as we sing, as we clap. I just pray that whatever you call us to do to worship you, I pray that we won't be afraid to do that, uh, that we won't be uh, afraid to sing out. Sometimes we, uh, we, we just look around, but I just pray that we will just look to you and focus on you and focus on uh, you because you're the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, and you have saved us, God. And we just thank you for what you're doing in our hearts, what you're doing in this place, in this church. And we just want to be used by you uh, to bless your kingdom and to further your kingdom here on earth. And so I just pray, God, that uh, whatever we're going through, whatever uh, we had going on this week or even the beginning of this whole year, God, I pray that uh, we can just lay all those things down before you and uh, in confidence say that my hope is in you, God. And so we thank you that you are the only hope and you are uh, the best hope. And so I just pray, God, that we will uh, place our trust and our faith in you this morning. And it's in Jesus' my name I pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Amen.
pray for the unbelief. And all the unbelief in this room will be gone. We can lift our hands to you full of faith, God. Full of faith that you heal. That you heal relationships, God. That you heal our physical bodies, God. That you heal our hearts. Thank you for taking our hearts, God, for cleansing them, for softening them up, God. Lord, we give you the areas that we have taken back. We surrender them to you right now. We just want to see you. We want to see you high and lifted up, God. We believe that you're here in this place, that you're here with us now. We believe that you're doing your work, God. So I just pray for all those people who need healing right now, that you would heal them, God. You'll get rid of the disease. Get rid of all the pain. But we want to be healed, but if we're going to forget you if we're healed, we don't want that. We want to remember you, God. We want to see your face. But we do thank you for that healing, God. We think that only comes from you.
that when we deserve death when we deserve to be apart from you God that you died on your place God thank you that you went on the cross so that we can have life with you God mercy is giving us something not giving us what we deserve and like I said we deserve death and we deserve to be apart from him but right now I just encourage you to just Lift your hands and just thank God for the mercy he's put in your life. For the times that we think that we can do it on our own. We just need to thank him for coming in and being there for us. The times that we've rejected him, the times that we've been the Lord of our lives. Just thank God for showing himself that he is Lord and that we need him. And I encourage you also that if you feel that mercy, if you feel that grace, to just bow down before him. Because a lot of times we think that when you bow down, that's showing that you're very sinful or something's wrong with you. But when you bow down, it shows that God is Lord of your life. It shows that you are under him and that you want to give him all the glory, that you're humbling yourself, that we know that our pride and our flesh is strong, but we want to humble ourselves before him and say, God, we want to give you everything.
that with your mercy that we don't have to stay in that guilt and shame. Thank you that your mercy is new every morning, God, and that this is the day that you have made and that we will rejoice and be glad in it. We will rejoice that we have that grace, that we have that mercy. Thank you, God, that we can just each day, even though we fall, that we can fall forward at your feet, God, that we can fall on our face and ask for forgiveness, God, and you forgive us just thank you so much for that for that peace that we have that only comes from you God for that joy for that hope for that love we pray right now as we continue to worship that whatever that we've done whatever guilt or shame that we have God that we'll just lay it at your feet God we'll lay it at the cross and we won't want to ever go back to it you don't want to look back behind us we want to just look to you God We want our eyes to be fixed on you. We thank you, God, that we can just run straight into your arms, God. And that you pick us up when we feel weak and when we feel low. That you defend us, God, when everyone's against us. That we don't have to fight for ourselves, God. That you will fight for us. 
pray right now that we will just let you be our defense in every area of our life, God.
I just want to say to you guys, uh, I just, I mean, I don't want to puff you up, but I want to just say I'm so proud of you guys because, you know, most churches are lessening their service, lessening the worship, lessening the teaching, and ours just keeps growing and growing. <laughs> and, and I just want to say it's so neat because I remember at Grace Chapel where God really moved in my life. I remember Pastor John used to say the first service was kind of shorter. It seemed like it was kind of like more in and out burger. But um, the second service, he says, we had an hour to worship and we had an hour to teach the word. And I just want to say, you know, I mean, we just worshiped for 45 minutes. I mean, how many of you know, most churches are doing 15, 20, and you just did double. So you guys are way ahead of the game there. And then the teaching, you know, I can go on for what, like? Three hours, no good. But I mean, <laughs> I tell you, the missionaries, it was so funny. The missionaries said to me, they said, Craig, you know, if you go over to China and you teach, they said, you could, could you preach for three hours straight? And I thought, I went, at first I went, no way. And then I went, yes, I could, easy. Because you have interpreters. So think about it, that's only an hour and a half. I've already preached in this pulpit an hour and 20 minutes, so I could eat. And they just sit there. They'll sit there for all day long. You can preach for three hours straight. They are there attentive and sitting. And then you go and kind of get a drink or something, and they're still waiting there for you to come back. How many know if I went to China, I'd probably never come back? Amen. I mean, it's just amazing, the hunger for the Word. But I just want to say, and, and I just pray you'll have that. Because you know what? How many know God didn't say build the biggest church, did he? He said, go and make disciples. And teach them to obey all that I've commanded you. That's it. And so how many know that? And Jesus, did, he didn't say, you know, my mega flock, did he? He said, my little flock. And he said, the road is narrow and few find it. And I want to tell you, I am so proud of you guys for hungering and thirsting. As Morgan taught last week, the Gospels, or the Beatitudes, what blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall what? Be filled. Right? If you just hunger to just punch your time card in and out of church, how many of you might not be filled? But if you say, God, I just want you, I want to worship you, I want to, I want to hear from you through your word, how many know God will meet you every time? Amen? And so I just wanted to just say, I wanted to kind of brag on you guys a little bit there. But anyways, which is hard for me to do, I don't do that, I don't like to flatter much. But anyways, it's not flattery, it's the truth. I want to say this, um, you know, we've been talking a lot about the gifts, and some of you, <laughs> I can tell some of you go, enough of the gifts. But I want know, if Paul, or God through Paul, devoted Two chapters to the gifts, tongues, prophecy, healing. How many know we should care about it? Amen? That's a weak amen. Hello. You guys awake? Hello? Right? We should care about it. And so I'm going to teach it because, hear this, what is our tendency as people? A.W. Tozer said it well. We are extremists. We go to one extreme or the other, but only the Holy Spirit can bring us balance. Amen? And we want the balance of, we don't want to be charismaniacs, right, that go beyond God, but we also don't want to be like, I was a Baptist, so I can say it, old Baptists that are so afraid of doing something weird that we do nothing. We want to be balanced. Amen? Can, can we just say this? Can we just say this out loud? How many of us just want all that God has for us? Can we say that? Say that. I want all that God has for me. That's it. I mean, I mean, I don't want you to push you to do something that isn't God, but I don't want you to shrink back from what is God. Amen. And, and I told you as a Baptist boy, when I, my Baptist teachers would tell me, you know, tongues are the least of the gifts and, and the sign gifts are not for today. And then I would hear Paul say, I speak in tongues more than you all. I heard him say, you know, I, I wish you all spoke in tongues. And, and I would just go, why would Paul say that this great man, if it was so worthless? And then I prayed about it, and then how many of God changed my heart? How many of sometimes teachers, not meaning maybe to be bad, can sometimes teach us things that aren't always biblical? How many of know that? And the Bible says that. Paul said, we just read that. Paul says, we know in part and prophesy in part. And that's why I say, pray for me, because I'm going to give an account for what I teach. Now, now, I think that's saying teachers that are false, that are kind of teaching things, but I need to really study. I, I mean, I study a lot. I forget, I think it was Mike Ryan, I said, he goes, how much do you study, like 10 hours, uh, 10 hours, I go, more like 20, 25, he goes, really? 
And it's, that, it's not that good. That's weird. No, no. But, you know, but I mean, I study a lot. No, I'm just kidding. Because I want to know the topic. You know what I mean? And I'm not the, obviously not the sharpest tool in the shed. I guess that doesn't make sense. But I'm not the, you know, I'm like a bowling ball. Okay, I need help. But I want you to know the word. And I want to make sure I'm teaching you what is the whole counsel of God. Amen? And so we're going to talk about today's uh, text is 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 20. And the title of today's message is Tongues Done Decently and in Order. And I want to tell you this. Can I just start off this? I'm going to ask you this again, but I want to just get this. How many have ever been to a church where someone just started cracking out in tongues and freaked you out? How many? Raise your hands high. Okay, at least half of you. Look at that. I mean, and, and, and I mean I, even if I'm in a church, I speak in tongues, and I'm in a church where they just start going off in tongues, it freaks me out. And I'm... I, I'm what it says, I'm a, I'm know about it. I'm I'm learned in it, and, and just because why? It's not biblical, but yet it's funny. I have great. I'm going to meet this Tuesday with a bunch of my Pentecostal brothers, and we're going to pray. And they, you know, they do that. And I always say, how can you do that when the scripture? And they just go, we just do it. You know, I, I love what one brother. I showed him a scripture. I said, how can you do that when the scripture says it? He goes, I just don't worry about it. Now, how many know when you say you don't worry about a certain scripture, that, that means you open the doors for a lot of things. How many know that? Whoa, better not be popping. But uh, we open the doors because, how many know, the, the, you know, I remember as a, as a liberal hippie coming to know the Lord, a lot of people when they come to the Lord, they're all like, oh, the Lord, the, the word is so restrictive. I didn't see it that way. When I came to the Lord, I was like, finally, some guardrails. You know what I mean? I felt like I was going down Mount Lemmon 125 miles an hour with no guardrails. But when I got saved, there were some absolutes. There were some truths that protected and guided me. And I was like, thank you for the word. Amen? How many can say amen to that? I didn't see it as restrictive. I saw it as protective. And God loves me and says, hey, there's certain things you don't want to do. And so anyway, we're going to talk about the gifts. Because I want us to move in the fullness of God. Not, as I said, beyond him, but not shrink back from him. I think we, because we teach the word, because we want to do things well, I think we kind of shrink back because we're afraid of messing up. But hear this, guys. The Bible says wherever the Spirit of God is, there's what? Liberty. Now, it's not liberty to just do whatever you want and sin, but it's liberty. How many know grace is there for you to do your best? And how many know when you're shooting for Jesus, you're going to miss it at times? It's not meant for you to just... Do whatever you want and willfully sin. But it's meant to live for God and go for it. And if you mess up, there's grace. How many know that? And that's what we want here. We want you to have liberty to go for it. And if you mess up, all we ask you to do is to be teachable, fat. Faithful, available, and teachable. And as long as we can, you know, leadership can come alongside you and say, hey, you know, you did good here, but maybe you could have done this a little better. You know, maybe when you gave that prophetic word, you shouldn't have spoke for 15 minutes. You know what I mean? Something like that. You know what I'm saying? Where you didn't preach a sermon. As long as you can be corrected, we want to welcome the liberty of the Spirit here. Amen? And so that's what we want. So anyways, let's pray. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for the sweet time of worship. And we just ask that right now we continue to worship you because, Lord, you said the worshipers you desire are worshipers who will worship you in spirit and in truth. And the way we know your truth is through what? Your word. And so, Lord, let us love it. Let us see, Lord, as one of my Pentecostal brothers said, the problem with you Calvaryites, you love, you, you're so restricted by the word. But, Lord, you, your word says in John 1.14 that you, Jesus, are the word become flesh. So I welcome to be restricted by you. I welcome to be guided by you. I don't want to go beyond you and do things in your name that are not of you. So, Lord, let us love your word. Let us want to be in line with your word. Let us believe that, as the Bible says, the the unity of the Spirit, that the Spirit is the one who inspired men to write your word. So the Spirit will never contradict the word because you and the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are all one, and you're always going to be in agreement. And so, Lord, let us be in agreement with you because we, like you, are committed to your word. We thank you, Lord. Your word says you hold your word even above your name. Think about that, above your name. And so, Lord, let us love your word and to see it as awe and reverence, not written by man and it can be picked and apart and pick some, reject others, but your word is living and active. Your word is from your very throne, not written by men, but or written by men, but inspired by God. God breathed. And let us believe it. It's the words of God. 
And therefore, we must treat it with reverence, with awe, and then submit to it. Lord, as James said, we don't want to just be hearers of your word. We don't want to just know your word. We want you, through your spirit, to make us effectual doers of your word, truth, to walk in the truth, because it's only as we walk in your truth that it will set us free. And so, Lord, we want that. Set us free. As we sang, one of the songs said, break the chains, break all the lies, all the chains that hold us back from being all that you have called us and gifted us to be in you. I just release, I just speak that right now. I just speak, break the chains in our lives, the lies Maybe our parents, maybe uh, a loved one, maybe if someone close to us just spoke lies to us and it just has wounded us. I pray you'll break those chains right now and just loose healing, loose, let your truth just set us free in Jesus' name. And everyone agreed, said, Amen. Amen. Verse 20 of 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Brethren, do not be children in understanding. So he's saying, don't be. Ignorant. Don't be like a little child that doesn't understand stuff. However, in malice or evil, be babes. But in understanding, be mature. So he's saying in the gifts, you need to be mature. You need to understand. And that's why Paul is going through this because how many of the Corinthians were moving in the gifts powerfully, but they weren't doing it decently in order. They were kind of going too far and going too far. And like I said, Satan will take us either to shrink back kind of where we are or go too far. But we want to find what? That perfect balance through the Holy Spirit. In their selfish desire, the Corinthians were trying to edify themselves at the expense of others. In the church meeting, the Corinthians showed themselves to be children and selfishly immature. And Paul points them to a higher call, to a better or greater balance. Paul says, be ignorant of evil, but in understanding be wise, as he goes on to add more understanding to the subject of tongues. And I want to tell you, for those of you who weren't here maybe, but I want to tell you, if you, we have all our teachings online on YouTube, but I want to say this, is I believe that the greatest gift of tongues is found in Jude 20. It says, as we pray in the Spirit, our spirit is built up. How many could use to have your spirit built up and encouraged? And that's what the gift, that's, that's my main use of the gift of tongues is to just pray. Like when I said this, you know, a couple weeks ago, we had uh, two people die. And when I speak to people who are going through loss, a lot of times I don't know what to say. So I'll just pray in the spirit. And all of a sudden, God will just quicken things to me. Because why? My spirit's praying with God's spirit and I'll get insights. And so I don't know if you ever need insights. But uh, you know what I mean? We need to have that gift. And I, I believe it's for everyone who wants it. You know what I mean? Not everyone, I believe, has a gift of tongues, meaning the interpretation. But I believe every Christian can speak in tongues. And how do we know that? Remember Mark 16? What do you say? These signs will follow those who believe. What will happen? They will lay hands on the sick. They will cast out demons. And they will what? Speak with other tongues. And so there it is. I believe that everyone who wants it can have it. Amen? Verse 21, in, now this is, now hear this, this is the most, they say, scholars say these next two verses are the most controversial or the most uh, hardest verses to understand in all scripture, New Testament. This right here, so you need to listen to this real carefully. Uh, verse 1, in the law it is written, and he's quoting from Isaiah, with men of other tongues and other lips, I will speak to this people, and yet for all that they will not hear me, says the Lord. Verse 22, therefore tongues are a sign not to those who believe, but to unbelievers. But prophesying is not for unbelievers, but for those who believe. These, as I said, are the very hard verses to interpret. And a lot of people have a lot of different interpretations. How many of those certain verses where people have a lot of different opinions? So I'm not saying, thus saith the Lord of what I'm saying here. I'm just picking one commentator that I really respect, and that's John Corson. And I'm going to say what he says and let you look at that because I think it's pretty interesting. Here's what John Corson says. He says, Paul has just quoted from Isaiah 28, 11 through 12. That's what he quoted there in verse 21. So, so now, and here it is. So now God will have to speak, and I'm reading from the New Living and kind of adding some of the King James. I like to do that. I kind of do an amplified Bible for you guys. So I do a little New Living and a new little King James. But you can check it on your own to make sure that it's right. So now God will have to speak to his people with stammering lips and another tongue through foreign oppressors who speak a strange language. Verse 12, God has told his people, here is a place of rest. Let the weary rest here. 
This is a place of quiet rest, but they would not listen. That's what Paul is quoting in verse 21 here. In Deuteronomy 28, the Lord also said, kind of in the same theme, he says, as my people turn their back on me and become cold towards me, they will hear the tongues of other nations when foreign invaders invade their land. Hear that. So what's going to happen is because they've rejected God or because they've gotten cold and callous, he says, you're going to hear strange tongues. And those strange tongues were uh, were the Assyrians coming in to invade them. And he's using that. Isn't it amazing, the typology in Scripture? How you look at it, you say, okay, so, okay, invade, you know, the, the, uh, the, the, the Jewish, the Jewish the Israelites grew cold towards God. God says, okay, now because you're cold to me, I'm going to let strange tongues come into your land. Basically, invaders that speak a different language. And Paul's now quoting this for tongues. So that's kind of a, a, wild, a wild paradox, isn't it? So what's he saying there? So here it is. So um, we see the fulfillment of this in Isaiah 28, 11 through 12. Because God's people had grown indifferent, And cold towards him, as I said, the Assyrians were now allowed to occupy their land because of the historical reference here found in Isaiah when Paul says tongues are a sign to them that believe not. It's John Corson's strong opinion that Paul is speaking not of unbelievers. Hear that. Not of unbelievers, meaning non-Christians, but he's speaking to believers who, like those in Isaiah's day, have grown indifferent and cold and callous towards the Lord. Isn't that good? You see that? He's saying, he's saying that tongues is a sign to those who've grown callous. And I'll tell you, let me give you an example of this. I remember as a good Baptist boy, believing I was a violent aggressor against tongue talkers. Right? That's the sort of thing you have to do when you go to Baptist Bible. You have to say, I confess and renounce tongues. Right? You don't say that. But I mean, you got to be. And so I remember, and I would see these charismatic people on the corners. Remember the Jesus movement? Remember all the hippies? I mean, people would be on the corners, and they wouldn't be saying shredding people. They would just say, repent, turn to Jesus. Do you remember those? Come to Jesus. And I remember going, how do they have the boldness to do that? And I'm a pretty bold guy, but I remember I never had the boldness to stand in a corner and just start proclaiming. And I remember just going away. And nine times in a ten, whenever you saw one of those people, they were charismatic. They were a charismatic person. They were a tongue talker. And I remember going, that's just weird that you don't see many Baptists in the corner, but you see all these charismatics in the corner. And what's and I remember just as a Baptist going, what's the difference? What is going on here? And it was a sign to me that something was different, that that something was maybe missing in my life. Even though I was saved, even though I knew Jesus, I remember that. In other words, Paul is speaking here to those who don't believe in the present power of the Holy Spirit. How many know, do you you know this? That for some strange reason, tongues seems to be the dividing line that separates people who have grown callous, who say, no, God isn't working that way today anymore. How many know that? How many know tongues is a big deal? Right? I mean, I told you, I went to Grace Chapel to disprove tongues. That's why I went. But, but, uh, you know, tongues seems to be a dividing line, doesn't it? It really does. I mean, it, it is a big deal. And you can say, oh, no, it isn't. Yes, it is. But hear this. What, what, it's like what he's saying, what John Corson believes, it's a dividing line to kind of show a judgment of those who've resisted the Holy Spirit. Let me give an example of this. Do you know the scripture we read a couple of weeks ago where it says that, um, where is it? I forget what it says. It says, uh, when, when the complete has come, or the perfect has come, then we'll have no need you know, for the imperfect. And what, do you know, before 19, oh, I think, it, when is Azusa Street? 1904? 1904? 1904. Before Azusa Street, everyone thought the perfect come was Jesus. But how many know after 1904, because of the charismatic renewal, then all of a sudden, Baptists, like I was, I can speak, but you can speak about your own family, that they said, no, the perfect is the word of God. And now when we have, or I'm sorry, the perfect is the word of God. And now that we have the canon of scripture, we don't need the gifts anymore. Do you see how? Because why? They wanted to sort of explain why they don't have that gift. So do you see how the gifts are sort of a sign? Or I wouldn't say a judgment of condemnation, hear that, but a judgment of something's missing. And why does someone like John, uh, John MacArthur, who I respect immensely, 
Great teacher. How many agree with that? Great teacher. But on the gifts, he's pretty even. John Piper said, whoa, because he basically said all the gifts are not for today, and it's strange fire. Like, you're, you're, you're demonic if you walk in the gifts. How many know that's bad? Because we're going to see later that it says, do not forbid speaking of tongues. Now, they'll say, well, I don't forbid it. But how many know you devalidate it hard enough, most people are not going to want it. You're subtly forbidding it. Amen. And so all I can say is I love John Piper. I mean, I love John MacArthur, but even as John Piper, who is, a, is close to him, said, I believe you've missed it big time on the gifts. And why is that? Why can't we, if it's not a big deal, why can't we respectfully agree to disagree? I don't have a problem. If you don't want to speak in tongues, right on. You know, I'm not going to say, you know, I'm not going to be like, remember the old Assembly of God people would say, this is why I got crazy with tongues, because someone said to me, do you, do you speak in tongues? And I said, well, they said, are you spirit-filled? And I said, uh, yeah, I'm spirit-filled. And they go, oh, well, I didn't know what that meant. I was a Baptist. And then they just started speaking in tongues. Well, I'm like, what are you doing? I was a brand new Christian. What are you doing? They go, we're speaking in tongues. And I go, what's that? And they go, oh, you're not filled with the Spirit. And I go, what do you mean? And they go, you're not saved. How do I know? Eh. Then I had a problem. That's when I became a violent. I found out, whoa, because they misused it. Amen. But if someone doesn't want, how many of you have as much of God as you want? If you go, God, I'm just not into tongues. How many know God will say amen? And you'll still go to heaven, but you'll find out when you go to heaven, possibly, man, I missed out on a lot of stuff. So you see that? So it's not like, so I'm not saying you guys, you guys aren't saved, you don't speak in tongues. I'm not saying that. But how many know there's a lot of people as I was that say, if you speak in tongues, you might have a demon, or you might be made up, or you might be strange fire. I mean, that's sort of weird. And so I'm saying to you, tongues is kind of a dividing line. It's sort of a judgment to those to say, what's the difference? And think about this. I'm going to say this later, but hear this. All I'm asking you, if this is freaking you out, good. Okay, no, if this is freaking you out, here, here's, here's what I'm saying to you. Just say like me, if this is you, God, I don't want to resist you. That's all I ask. I'm not asking you to go be blah, 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 and be a tongue talker. I'm asking you to be open to the fullness of God. That's all I want. Amen. Amen? There you go. Come on. Preach it, brother. Right. That's all I want. Okay? So if you say, well, sorry, realize you're not fighting me. You're fighting what? God. And that's all I ask you not to do. He's not moving, and people say he's, God's not moving in this manner anymore. Those miracles in the days of Jesus and Paul, these gifts were for a different time, a different period, a different dispensation. They're dispensations. They don't believe the gifts for today. And, but what did Jesus say? I'm, he said I'm the, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Right? So why would the gift? And hear this, guys. If we needed the gifts in the Jesus movement, if we needed the gifts during the start of the church, you know, in 2000, and, and, you know, with Jesus, how many know we need the gifts today? Come on. Seriously? I mean, have you seen our world lately? Do you watch the news? I can't watch the news. I start wanting to go, I mean, I get in trouble, right? I got to limit my news because I can get crazy, right? Take that off the tape, please. Anyway, but um, I believe for sure this is what God through Paul is saying through this verse. This is what I know for sure. I, I, the interpretation, there's a lot of different interpretations, but I like that one that John gave. But hear this. This is what I believe God is saying is what Stephen said to the people in Acts. Remember Stephen, the first martyr? Here's what he said, Acts 7, 51. He says, must you forever resist the Holy Spirit? Now, I don't know about you. I don't want to be accused of resisting the Holy Spirit. Do you? And isn't it funny how we break it down, how we go, oh, I love Jesus, and I love the Father, but that Holy Spirit. Isn't that kind of weird? The great three in one, but yet somehow we go, Father, cool. Jesus, really cool. Spirit, hmm. He's like the crazy uncle to a lot of us. I mean, it's the same God, just different attributes. And we need to say, hey, as long as it's the Holy Spirit, I'm open. You know, when I was at, at Grace, things at the end, there was a spirit, but I don't know if it's always the Holy Spirit. Amen? Right? There's a lot of things done in the name of the Holy Spirit that aren't holy. But how many know this? I believe the gift of tongues is a holy thing when, as we're going to see, you're done decently in an order according to the Word of God. Amen? Are we cool with that? Yeah. So just, I just want us to not be a church that resists the Spirit. That's all I'm saying to you. You can say whatever you want with that verse. And if you disagree with John, you're wrong. But it's cool. But anyway, <laughs> verse 23. 
Therefore, if the whole church comes together in one place and all speak with tongues, and there comes in those who are uninformed or those who don't speak in tongues or unbelievers, they will, will they not say that you are out of your mind? Now, this always amazes me. How's my Pentecostal brothers? I can show them this verse and they'll go, I don't care. <laughs> you know, kind of, I, I like to be out of my mind. And, and I told them when they came here, I said, I go, I go, I said, you come here if you speak in tongues. Remember we did the open prayer thing? I said, if you come here, you have to interpret if you speak in tongues. I'm not going to forbid you to speak in tongues, but if you speak in tongues, you got to interpret. And they go, just make sure, brother, you're not resisting the Holy Spirit. I said, I know I'm not, because the Bible says to do that, right? The Bible says, don't just crack off in tongues. The Bible says, if you're going to speak in tongues, you need to interpret it. Didn't Paul say that? He said, I'd rather speak five intelligent words than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. Right? And then you guys wake, hello. hello. You know? And so he say, you know, and so I say this to them, and they just kind of go, eh, don't care. Now, how many know this? <laughs> Hear this, guys. If your tradition or your feeling of the word, of, the, of your, your way of Christianity goes against the word, how many know somebody's wrong and it's you? If your life or doctrine is not in line with the word of God, guess what? Who needs to yield? You do. Amen? And I, I just, I always get weird. I mean, I love my Pentecostal brothers, but I got to be honest. When they say, oh, I don't really worry about that scripture, how many know that scares me? Because it's like, so how can you say, I really worry about this scripture, but I don't really worry about this scripture. You got to be concerned of all the whole counsel of God. Amen. You don't get to pick. It's not like a salad bar. Ooh, garbanzo bean. Mm -mm. You, you got to pick everything. You got to say, as, as long as it's in the word, it's all God. Amen. And so you can't pick and choose. But anyways, as valid of a sign as the proper use of tongues is, the improper use of them in the congregation setting is helpful to no one. And people will think you're nuts if they don't speak in tongues. And I remember, I mean, just crazy. I remember hearing on the radio, this guy just spoke in tongues for like five minutes and it was just on KGMS and it was right after me and I was like, right before me and I'm like, ah, and there was no interpretation. I remember just going, this is just weird. This is freaking so many people out. And why, you know what I mean? Do you know what the word perversion means? You know what it means? It means a use in which it was not intended. Amen? Tongues is a beautiful thing when it's used in the right manner, right? Just like a fire in a fireplace is beautiful, but if that fire is in the middle of your living room, it's not a beautiful thing. Amen? It can become perverted and wrong and light your whole house on fire. Amen? And so we need to make sure that tongues is in its right place. Now hear this. What do we tend to do as Calvarites? Well, we don't want to burn anything, so we just won't ever speak in tongues. That's not the answer either, right? That's shrinking back and missing a beautiful gift I believe God has for all of us. Verse 24. But if all prophesy and an unbeliever, an uninformed person comes in, he is convinced by all, he is convicted by all. Verse 25. And thus the secrets of his heart are revealed and so falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is truly among you. Isn't that good? Did you hear that? Whether prophecy is shared through someone teaching the word or through someone giving a prophetic word where it stands up like Mariah giving a word or sometimes I do or sometimes Morgan will, a prophetic word. And, we, and we're kind of, how do I say this? We try to be supernaturally natural, right? We don't do this where, thus saith the Lord, the glory. You know, we don't talk in the King James and start getting a little southern accent. So we just start talking. And sometimes you don't even know we're prophesying, but we're saying what we feel God's saying. And how many know, I, I like that, right? I don't know why all of a sudden you prophesy. You got to be speaking old King James and, you know, glory. We have a guy, my Pentecostal friend, my kids always tease him. He talks like me, and then all of a sudden he gets in the spirit, and it's like, the Lord, the Lord ought not, the Lord would say to you today. Where does that come from? <laughs> Where? Is the, does that how the Holy Spirit talks, you know? I think the Holy Spirit, if anything, he's talking Hebrew, bro. He's not going, the Lord would say to you. And he gets a big bouffant hairdo. No, you know, no. That's man-made stuff, because we think that makes us spiritual, right? But I mean, oh, God talks, right? I don't think Jesus said, hold on, my brothers, I'm going to prophesy. I think he just talked, and people said, didn't your heart burn within you? Oh, my goodness, that was for us. Oh, wow. And how many like things done supernaturally natural, right? I don't like all the pomp. I've seen it all, and I don't like it. You know, I used to wear, can you imagine me? I used to wear an Armani suit. Do you remember, you remember that? I used, to, I used to deck out and be all like, how you doing? I was ready for TBN set, and... Uh, 
You know, I, I loved all the prosperity doctrine. The only thing, it didn't work. So that's why I didn't like it. But, uh, you know, if it worked, I would have loved it. But it, it only works for the high up guys, you know. It works for Joel Steen and him only. But anyway, but um, anyway, where was I? Sorry, Joel. But um, when the word is spoken forth, the power, of the, and the power of the Spirit in the sanctuary and the Wednesday night groups or among believers in all sorts of contexts, it convinces and it convicts through a single message, miraculously, custom made for each hearer. This can be done through the gift of prophecy, either by an evident word of prophecy, meaning someone standing up like Mariah, or by spontaneous word of prophecy hidden in the message from the teacher or preacher. I want to ask you this. And here, this isn't for me. This is for you guys. How many times when Morgan or Kevin or I have spoken, God has spoken a word right to you? Raise your hands high so we can see. Almost everyone. Now, I can't speak for Kevin's really smart and Morgan's smarter, but hear this. I'm not that smart. And when you hear something, you go, how did Craig know? You know, in the early days, they used to say, as people would say at Grace, they would say, they'd bring someone and say, hey, why did you tell Pastor Craig about me or tell someone? They would say that, and, and how many know, that wasn't me knowing anything. That was just the Holy Spirit speaking. I'll never forget. I'll tell you a story real quick, since we don't care about time here. But here it is. Uh, I'll never forget my friend Greg. I, I just received the, the gift of tongues, and he was a Baptist boy like me, and so he's really concerned about me. So he came down from Oregon to kind of fix me. And he comes, and so he comes into Grace Chapel at the first time. He's really skeptical like me. He's trying to fight it. And uh, that day, we play basketball. I'm not a basketball player, even though I'm tall. I'm more of a wrestler. So when we play at the U of A, I would basically, he'd go up for a shot, and he was kind of always getting around me. So I basically would just tackle him and threw him on the ground. So I just slammed him on the ground, and it was a cement court. And so he hurt his hip, and he'd hurt it in football. And he goes, man, Rotors, you hurt my hip again. And he goes, and he said this, and, and said it in front of all of us. He said, I feel, that day I think he was turning 21. He says, I feel like an old man and my hip is always going to feel this way. He said that out loud. And so all of a sudden, do you remember uh, 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 Roy Hicks Jr.? Do you remember Roy Hicks Jr.? Do you remember Roy Hicks Jr.? You remember? Roy Hicks Jr. came and all of a sudden my friend's sitting there. And then I'm talking to Gray Sites here. And, uh, and Roy Hicks Jr., you guys remember? And, and I'm sitting there and I'm next to my friend. And all of a sudden this, this guy, Roy Hicks Jr., goes, I really feel like the Lord has a word for somebody. You don't really want to be here. You're skeptical, skeptical of all this. You're, you're not sure this is real. And you just said today that your hip, your right hip is hurt, and you're, you're old, and it's your birthday, and you are never going to be healed. Well, God is telling you you're healed today, right now. And I'm like, I didn't say anything. I didn't say. I mean, I'm new to this. I'm a new character. I'm like, I didn't. I didn't. And I just, I, I didn't. Well, I didn't even do that. I just sat there like this going, uh-oh, he's going to hate me. I was so freaked out. I was just freaked But here's where it gets good. So the meeting was like seven hours. I mean, it went on forever. It was a, it was a pastor's conference, and so we like to talk. And so all of a sudden, I'm sitting there. My friend Greg is we're walking out of the church, and all of a sudden, he's going like this. And, I, and I'm going, what are you doing? And I totally forgot about the word. He goes, my hip, it's healed. How many know he became a charismaniac after that night? Now, how many would like to see that kind of stuff done supernaturally natural again? I became a believer. He was like, he's more of a charismatic than I am now. How many know when God, you, you can't deny that. You know, you could say, I don't lack it or whatever. But when all of a sudden your name's called out and, you, and he, he wasn't going, I received that, brother. He was like, that's weird. And God, and he was trying. I said, what are you doing? He said, I'm trying to make it hurt again. How's that for faith? You know, I mean, that's what he said. I'm trying to mess it up. Something's wrong. It feels good. You know, I mean, don't you love God? I love God. But I love people saying, you don't have enough faith, brother. How much faith did my friend have? Zero. But God still mercifully touched him. And now he's a, belie now he's a believer in the gifts. Amen? So, uh, you know, but, and that's what I pray. How many would like that to happen here? I, I don't have to wrestle someone to believe in the gifts. I want it just to where God flows to where people go, my goodness, how could I resist the gifts? I saw God move in my life. God spoke to me. God touched me. God healed me. And think about this. It's great. You know what? The most of the miracles I've ever seen as a charismatic have been in the highways and byways. God doesn't just do parlor tricks here to make us believe believers believe. He'll heal us. But I mean, he wants to really do signs and wonders out there to touch people so they go, man, God is real. You know? Amen?
I love this. Uh, as I said, that rhema word. I, I love when God, that's one of the biggest thrills is when you tell me that God spoke somehow through me or through his word, but as I was teaching and it was beyond me. I love this. Hebrews 4.12 says, the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. How many love that? It's just, I mean, he gets right there. He can call you out and touch you. And, and don't you love it? I mean, I'll sometimes, you know, I'm crazy, so I can say it. But I mean, I will just all of a sudden be speaking. Sometimes I'm aware of it. Sometimes all of a sudden I'll feel like the Lord's directing me to some place I, wasn't, I didn't have notes. And I write everything down because I'm squirrel. You know, I can go anywhere. So I write everything down. But sometimes he'll just give me something that I didn't have, and I can tell that's kind of a rhema word. Yeah. And a ra- prophetic rhema, a rhema word, for those of you who don't know, is a s- specific, that's rhema right there, that's the rhema word. No, okay. A rhema word is a specific word for a specific person. It's the, logos is, just, is the word, but it's when the word becomes alive to you and all of a sudden God goes, you know, when you read the word, oh, that's for me. That's a rhema word, right? And then when I'm teaching and you hear, oh, that's just what I was talking about. And I could go on stories after stories of how people have done, seen that and just been touched. And it's the most exciting thing because it's beyond me. You know what I mean? It's, like, it's just God's incredible love for you guys that he speaks to you powerfully through his word. So rhema word, there it is. All right. Um, and people through this come to a neat conviction of the Holy Spirit in this manner. And what I love most about this verse, hear this, is that when we're moving in the gifts of of the Spirit, supernaturally natural, that even unbelievers will say, God is truly among you and fall down and worship. How many like that? Hear this. You know what I love? You always hear me, and I know somebody, and I had someone, one of my Pentecostal brothers last meeting said, do not look back in the days of Grace Chapel. Release it, brother, and go forth. Okay, <laughs> I don't want old wine in new wine skins or old whatever, you know, I don't want the old stuff. But here's what I love about Grace Chapel, right? Grace Chapelites, I loved that someone like me could come in as an unbeliever of the gifts and be so touched in one meeting that I was saying, okay, God, I'm open to what you have. That's cool. Or I would love where an unbeliever could come. You could bring an unbeliever to this church, and they might be freaked out, but they go, surely God is in your midst. Because the secrets of their heart are revealed. Because they sense the presence of God. And if you ask me, Craig, what is your biggest longing for? That's what I long is what people would say. Not Craig is sexy. Because okay, that ain't going to happen. Right? But not, well, maybe about Morgan. But not about me. But I want them not to say the worship team's great or the pastor's great. But I want them to say what? God is in your midst. I sense God. I heard God. He touched me. Amen? How many want that? Amen? That's what we want. Yeah, come on. God said, I want that. Yeah. Verse 26. How is it then, brethren, whenever you come together? Now, now hear this in the same vein he's correcting here. So here's a correction because we sometimes read this wrong, I think. He says, how is it, brethren, then, brethren, whenever you come together, each of you has a psalm, has a teaching, has a tongue, has a revelation, has an interpretation. You hear all the stuff they have? Let things be done for edification. So we take that as a good thing. Oh, everyone has a song. Everyone has, everyone has something. But here at the end, he says edification. Because the Greek manuscript contains no punctuation, the question is, where does the question mark belong? They have it here after brethren, but the context strongly indicates, and most scholars agree, that it actually belongs after the word interpretation. This would change the meaning of this verse of how is it that every one of you is trying to get in on the act? Do you hear that? Every one of you is trying to get up front. Every one of you is trying to be seen. When you meet together like that, it's total confusion. Hear this, guys. This is something for any of you who long to be a pastor or want to be in ministry or want to teach. Here is the biggest thing that at least I've wrestled with is a lot of times people want to be in ministry or want to be a counselor for them to feel good. For them to say, look at me. Don't I teach the word good? I knew something. You didn't know that, did you? Look at me. How many of God doesn't need that? He doesn't, ministry is not for me to go, oh, look at me, oh, right? No, it should be me wanting to what? Edify and build you up and feed you. What did you say? Look good in front of my sheep. No, he said, feed my sheep, love my sheep. It's about you. 
right? It's not about me looking good and you praising me. It's about me caring about you. And like Paul said in Galatians, to see Christ formed in you, see you change into the image of Christ. Live more like Christ. That's the goal. And hear this, guys. So many of us as ministers minister to be seen. And how many know God can't bless that? The pride of a man will bring him low, but a man of lowly spirit or a humble spirit will find what? Honor. Because a man or a woman of humble spirit will say, I care about others. I want to minister. It's not about me looking good or me talking. It's about me ministering to somebody. How many see that? And so what the Corinthians were doing is, look at me. Look at my gift. Right? Look at me speaking in tongues. Look at me prophesy. Look at this. And it says it was bringing confusion. It was bringing insanity. How many know if every one of you gave a prophetic word, we would not get out of here till what? Six tonight, probably. And Paul says, as we're going to see in a moment, hey, things need to be done in a certain way in this. Verse 27. If anyone speaks in a tongue, here it is, let there be two or at the most three, each in turn. So meaning to hear that, no more than three, I can't say three, no more than three people speak in tongues. Three. And they all need to do it in turn, not all at once, but all together, all at once. I mean, sorry, all single, each one. And then he says, what? Let one interpret. So again, you don't speak in tongues in the assembly unless there's somebody who can interpret it. Amen? So that's it. And I don't care what my Pentecostal brothers, they're, they're, I love them, but they're wrong. Okay? Because the Bible says that pretty clear. Okay? So there it is. No more than three. No more than three. And there it is, and one interpret. Then it says, verse 28, but if there is no interpreter, let him be, keep silent in the church and let him speak to himself and to God. Remember when you speak in tongues, you're really speaking to who? God. So just speak alone. You'll hear, I'm speaking in tongues all the time in the service. All the time. But you'll never, by the grace of God, hear me because I'm doing it quietly. If you maybe came up to me and snuck up to me, you can maybe hear a little bit. But I'm not going to break out and go, Kodabashandara. I'm not going to do that because most people, ha, ha, right? You would leave. Squirrel, you know, I mean, you'd freak out. But I do it quietly because it's praying to God and my spirit's built up and I'm doing it just to worship and be close to him. Do you see that? I have no need to show off that to you. Amen? And because most of you would freak out anyway. But here it is. Um, verse 29. Let two or three prophets speak and let the others judge. So here it is. No more than three prophetic words. Isn't that amazing? He limits it. Okay. Three prophetic words, the most, and then one person. Let the other people who have prophetic gifting judge it to see if that word is from God. And if you remember from Grace, Grace Chapel, people would come up. They wouldn't just stand up. We'd kind of grab them if they did that. But what people would do is they come forward and talk to someone like Morgan or me, or talk to me probably, and say, hey, I feel this from God. And then I would judge it. Uh, I think that's the Lord. Or John, someone would. And then they would be able to go up and share it or you know, we'd figure out what to do with it. Amen? And that's the way it should be. It shouldn't just be breaking out in the middle where someone just stands up. Because think about that. If someone just stands up in the middle of service and it's not a godly word, then what do we have to do? We have to drag you out. And that's going to be a pretty sad day, right? It's going to be pretty embarrassing if we say, you know, because people do that. I don't know if you remember Grace, but people get up. This one person got up at Grace and said, we trust in the horses and we trust in the strength of men. And, we tr-. and we're like, that's totally opposite of what we do not trust in horses. We do not trust. And so I had to get up there and go, Yay, whoa, well, we don't trust in the, and it was just not a good day, right, to have to lovingly spank them and say that word was not of God, you know, so it's better to check it before you just start speaking it out, amen? So Paul's solution to the confusion was to allow two or three to speak in tongues or to prophesy in the congregation setting only if they accompanied by interpretation, prophecy doesn't need interpretation, you just judge it. Uh, the rest were to think through what was being shared and determine if it, what was heard was in the harmony and totality of Scripture. How many know this? It's good to know the Word. So that way, if you hear something, you can judge it with Scripture and say, wait a sec, I don't, you know, that goes against the Word of God, right? That, that goes against the Word. And we should be able to judge it according to the Word. Amen? Verse 30, But if anything is revealed to another who... Who sits by, let them or let the first keep silent. As the gifts of the Spirit are operating in the congregational setting, be careful. Hear this, this is another thing good. Be careful not to dominate or monopolize the meeting as you're waiting on the Lord together, says Paul. Hear this, guys. 
your gifting should not dominate. If you come up here and gave a prophetic word, it shouldn't be a 15-minute prophetic word. It shouldn't be a sermon. I remember one time I let a guy uh, from a church I was at last night uh, speak in my youth group, and I said, you have 15 minutes to share your testimony. Well, 55 minutes later, he was done. How many know he never spoke again in my youth group? Right? He's a pastor now, but he never spoke again. In my, because I, I just like, dude. And I sort of said, I said, hey, bro, it's 20 minutes. You know, I was trying to, and he goes, I'm in the middle of my message. And I'm like, I have a message. You were just supposed to share a little test about it. Right? I love this perfect example of this about embarrassment. D.L. Moody, has anyone heard of D.L. Moody, the great evangelist? D.L. Moody, he, he, he was at a meeting. I, just, I love the guts of it. You think I'm bold? These old timers were way more bold than me. D.L. Moody, he's a big boy like me. D.L. Moody gets up and he says to his brother, Brother Wilson, close the meeting in prayer, sir. And he says, fine. Well, the guy prayed for 15 minutes. So D.L. Moody stands up and he says, he says, let's stand and sing a hymn as Brother Wilson finishes his prayer time. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I mean, no, that was sort of, I think that could ruin your day. I think that could be pretty sad if D.L. Moody pretty much said, dude, stop. I mean, you know, I mean, I bet you he wasn't breaking out to pray much after that for a while. But anyways, verse 31. For you can prophesy one by one that all may learn and all may be encouraged. Verse 32, and the spirits of prophets are subject to prophets. Sometimes people will justify odd behavior, have you seen this, by saying they were overwhelmed by the Spirit. Ever seen that? Someone do something, they say, the Spirit made me do it. Did you hear what that said? The spirit of the prophets are subject to the prophets. That means your spirit is not going to make you do anything. Right? Now, people are afraid. They think, if I yield to tongues, all of a sudden I could just start in the middle of my, you know, I could be doing a presentation at work and just start speaking in tongues. No, you have a choice. You got, you know, I never forget this first time I was prayed for, and, and, you know, and people call it slain in the spirit. Well, who wants to be slain in the spirit? Do you need to be killed? I, I don't feel like being killed soon, right? But, but, but I believe, I, I said, Lord, what is it? And going under the power where you just kind of, your body just kind of gets overwhelmed by the spirit, and sometimes you fall. And I don't think it happens a lot, but I've had it happen twice to me, and I'm not one of those people that just loves to fall down. But I mean, but I said, God, what is it? And he says, you're overwhelmed by the spirit. But here's the key, I want to say this. As this person prayed for me, I could have resisted it. It wasn't like I went, whoa, and I just flew across the room. I could have said, I could feel myself going, wow, I really just want to fall backwards, but, but this is sort of weird. I hope there's someone big enough to catch me. I mean, that's what I was sort of thinking. I seriously, I hope there's not a little three-year-old that would be really sad. But I, but, but I went, I, I could just go. And so I just went, okay, and I just fell. But I mean, you see what I mean? I could have stopped it. It wasn't like God threw me across the room. It wasn't God slammed me down. And that's what the Spirit is, Amen. I mean, how do you say it? People always say the Spirit's a gentleman. Sometimes the Spirit will knock you down. How many of He knocked Paul off his horse. I mean, not always a gentleman, but, but he is most of the time. He gives you free will, right? And just know that. And so, so when people say that, oh, the Spirit made me do it. No, you did it. And I, I love this. I was talking, let me say this. I don't know if you've you heard of the Toronto Blessing. I've told you about the Toronto Blessing of the barking and all the craziness. And I never forget asking the guy who's over it, and I talked to him because I don't like to dog people without talking to them to make sure what they're saying is true. And so I talked to him. And I remember I was, it was here in town. And I said, I said, brother, you know, some of this stuff or a lot of this stuff just really seems like it's the flesh. And you know what he said to me? He goes, yeah. I said, uh, he goes, about 80% of it's flesh. And he'd been doing this for almost 30 years now. Or not 30 years, but at least 20, 25. I go, 80% of it's flesh? And he goes, yeah. And I go, isn't that, a, well, shouldn't it be the other way around maybe? Like maybe, I'd like it even more like 5% flesh, 95% spirit. And he says, he goes, well, I just don't want to hinder people from just expressing himself and being free in the spirit. How many of you know, hear this, guys? I'm the bus driver. This is a bus. God's the head. He's the head of all the buses. But how many of you know, I'm the bus. And if you guys get crazy, I'm supposed to go, uh, class, guys, sit down. You know, I'm supposed to direct the bus. And if the bus driver is saying 80% of the students are going cuckoo, that's a terrible bus driver. Okay? Right? How, how was your uh, bus today? Well, 80% of them are disobedient and going crazy and throwing things out the window. I mean, that's sad. And we need to make sure that things are done right. And I just thought that was so terrible. And I just said, well, that kind of answered my question about it. 
because it's such a bad statistic. It shouldn't be 80%, 80% flesh. It should be pretty much spirit. But here's, but here's Paul says that even when ministering in the spirit, man is never out of control. And what is one, hear this, what is one of the fruits of the spirit? Self-control. So if you're filled with the spirit, then one of the things of the spirit is self-control. The spirit is not going to make you go cuckoo. And I love this. I, I, here, I'm going to say this. This lady, she gave a prophetic word. Is Rachel here today? Is Rachel? Where's Rachel? Rachel, how you doing? I'm going to embarrass Rachel. Everyone say hi to Rachel. But this woman gave a word to Rachel. And this is before Rachel was amazing and really bold. But Rachel was a little shyer back then. And this lady, goes, she goes to Rachel. She goes, Rachel! She says, be bold in the name of Jesus. Come out and be bold and just speak the word and you just go forth. And, and she did it in front of everyone like I'm doing right now. <laughs> a jerk. Right? And, and she did that. And the word was right on. It was good. Be bold. Step out. You know, you know don't be timid. And, but she did it in front of everyone. And so I came with the lady and I said, you know, that word was good. It was right on. But I said, why did you have to do it in front of everyone? And she says, when the Spirit comes upon me, I cannot control myself. I just start to speak. And I said, well, what about this verse? I don't care what that verse says. I tell you what the Spirit does to me. What does the Bible say? Let God be true and every man be a liar. I said, girlfriend, you ain't going to last long here. You know, I didn't say that, but she didn't. Because if you're going to give a word, I welcome a word, but you better be open to correction to say, because I said, that would have been a lot better word if you would have just gone to Rachel May with one other woman and just spoken that in love more quietly. Because if someone's a little timid and shy, you don't want to point them out like I just did in front of everyone. Right? Okay. No, okay. just teasing Rachel. Rachel's bold now. I shouldn't care. Right, Rachel, you love me? Okay, good. But, you know, and, and the, but the person wasn't open to correction. And they blamed it on the Spirit. And how many know that's not right? Because the Spirit does not go against its word, the Word. Amen? So there it is. All right, verse 33. We've got to roll. God is not the author of confusion. Who's the author of confusion? Satan, all right? He's not the author of confusion, but of peace. And in all the churches of all the saints. And how many know, if you've ever been in some charismatic meetings, that is all you sense is confusion. You're like scared. You're like, what are they going to do now? That is not God. God is not a God of confusion. Now, it might be intense. It might be exciting. But it's not scary. It's not like being in a haunted house. Like, what is going to jump out at me? Right? It's, it's an awe. It's a reverence. It's not scary. If teaching is being given, the Lord is not going to interrupt himself with some kind of prophetic outburst, for he's not the author of confusion. I mean, is if I'm speaking, unless I'm a false teacher, maybe God would send a prophet to say, I rebu- you know, that's not of God. But if I'm teaching the word of God, how many of the Spirit's not going to interrupt me and say, whoa, I got something better to say than you're saying. That is not God. Yet people will do that all the time. And again, people do that grace and they'd have to be yanked out. And how many know, not a good day. You're not probably going to come back excited when you've been yanked out in front. And in Grace, remember how Grace had the big, huge aisle, so it was like drag, 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 drag forever, and everyone saw you, and it was not a good day. Well, how many of you look at verse 34? We are out of time. Does anyone see that verse? (laughs) Yeah. We're going to let Kevin teach that verse next week. So, So if you would... Because I want the ladies to like me. Let's skip to verse 39. But hear this. Hear this. So I'm not a wimp. I'm going to talk about it next week. So you ladies, make sure you come with knife sharpened, ready to go. No, I'm No, I'm just kidding. No, I'm just teasing. But come and we'll talk about what the Bible has to say about ladies and their yappers. All right. Anyways, verse 39. Make sure you're listening. Husbands, no, I'm No, I'm kidding. Verse 39, therefore, brethren, desire earnestly to prophesy and do not forbid speaking as to speak with tongues. Hear that. Remember that desire there earnestly means to what? To lust, to covet, to desire. Think about how very rarely do you go, oh, Lord. Now we pray, oh, Lord, give me more money. Oh, Lord, give me a better job. But how much do you say, Lord, use me to prophesy your words to people, to encourage. Remember we said prophecy today isn't so much foretelling or foretelling the future as it is foretelling the heart of God to his people. We should have that heart, amen? I want to speak your words. When I speak to my kids, when I speak to my friends, when I speak to people in the church, I want to speak forth the heart of God. Think about how great this church would be. It's a good church, but think how great it would be if everyone didn't come. I hope the worship is good today. I hope they're not as long as they were last week. 
I hope Craig can preach good. Think if you didn't just say, bless me, but think if you said, I'm coming here, Lord, and use me to bless somebody, whether it be a word of knowledge, whether it be prophecy, whether it be uh, to hug someone, whether it be to take someone to lunch, whether it be just to say to someone, hey, I care, can I pray with you? Pray for someone to be healed. Think of how great that would be if everyone came with a heart to bless rather than be blessed. And what does the Bible say? Remember we read that it says, those who refresh others, they themselves shall be what? Refreshed. You come to be blessed, there's a good chance you're not going to be blessed. You say, bless, bless me, Lord. Bless me. But if you come, Lord, I want to bless somebody. I, yeah, I want to be blessed, but I trust as I come with a heart to serve and bless others that I'm going to be blessed. Does that make sense? A lot better attitude. Than that. So he says, therefore, brethren, desire earnestly to prophesy and do not forbid to speak in tongues. That's the verse I also read. And I remember going, how can we talk so bad about tongues? It's demonic, as, as, uh, as people like MacArthur will say. It's made up. That seems like you're forbidding it, does it not? Who wants a demon? Does anyone want a demon? No. So you're kind of saying you shouldn't do it. Whether you don't, you might not outwardly forbid it, but you're making it so scary that no one in their right mind is going to want it, right? But he says, don't forbid speaking in tongues. And why would Paul, why would God through Paul say that if he didn't know in the last days people would have be so freaked out by tongues? Because the temptation is it's too weird. Too many people have done weird stuff with it. Let's just not ever do it. But he says, don't do that. That's going too far the other way and bind it. Don't do that. Don't forbid it. Verse 40, hear this. Let all things be done. Hear that. Can I recognize that? Let all things in the Spirit be done. Everything that God has for us, let it be done. Liberty, do it. But, here's the, here's the preface, decently and in order. That's what a lot of Pentecost, you know. There's two parts of this last verse. Things must be done decently and in order, but let things be done. Amen? Let the Spirit be done. Let it be done. Because I think about, we're such a teaching church, we're so afraid, what if we mess up? I'm a perfectionist, what if I mess up? My grandpa used to say this to me, if you can't do it right, don't do it at all. How many know that's failure? Well, we say, if you don't try, that's what's wrong, right? How I many know Hank Aaron struck out two thirds more times than he hit home runs, but you don't remember his strike goes, you only remember him being the home run hitter if you know baseball. You got to swing sometimes for the fences. Sometimes you're going to swing and miss and fly, and the bat's going to fly, and you're going to fall down. But how I many know there's grace for that? But if you don't try, eh, I'm not going to, you know, Lord, you're, you know, I don't want to mess up, so I'm just going to do anything. What did God say about that wicked, lazy servant doesn't do anything? He says, cast him into outer darkness with his weeping and gnashing of teeth. That doesn't sound good. God would rather have you swing for the fences and mess up sincerely, and then he has grace for that. Amen? So he says, let things be done. Let it be done. Hear this. I love this verse. And I'm sorry I've gone long, but it's just my gift. Hear this. Proverbs 14, 4. Well, you're going to love this. Where there is no ox, where no oxen are, the trough or stall is clean, but much increase comes from the strength of an ox. Can I recognize that for you? When you don't have an ox, your stall is clean. But when you have an ox, I mean, you have stuff. There's messes. Amen? Now, I'm one of those people who says, mm, I don't want messes. Well, okay, good, but you'll have no increase. So guess what? If you want to move in the gifts of spirit, you got to be willing to have a few messes now and then. It's like having kids, right? If you want kids, you got to have some messes now and then, right? you got to have some diaper explosions, right? you got to have it. You don't want it, but you just do, right? You know, don't you love you grab a kid? Oh, my, right? It's like, oh, you know, I mean, that's why I don't grab your kids. I mean, I've done it for kids. I'm done. I don't want that thing. But do you get my point? You got to be willing to make a mess. You got to crack a few eggs to make an omelet. If you never risk, right? we sing that song, Risk the Ocean. If you don't risk... You're never going to see no guts, no glory. you got to risk stepping out. But all of us want to make sure. But guess what? That's why it takes faith. Because you got to risk being possibly wrong or not doing it exactly right. But guess what? You don't risk. You don't, you're not willing to have some messes. You won't have increase. How many want increase in the Lord? Then you got to be willing to do all things, even if it's a little messy at first. First part of our Pentecostal brothers, they got the first part of this verse down, right? What do they got down? Let all things be done, right? All things. Ooh, ooh. I mean, they do everything, right? They'll do everything and beyond. And they, that's a little too far. While our Baptist brothers excel in the other part, which is what? Decently in order. So decent, you're never going to have a mess. But guess what? 
they don't have, in my opinion, the fullness of the Spirit. They're saved. Don't get that. Don't hear that. But they don't have the fullness. Like John MacArthur always jokes. He says, people say, man, John, you're such a good teacher. Think how good you could be if you were filled with the Spirit. And he goes, well, who do you think is teaching to me right now? But how many know that there, I believe John could even be a better teacher if he was really yielded to the Holy Spirit? I, I believe that. I do believe that. What I believe the Lord has for our Baptist brothers, which I used to be, so I can say that, and our Pentecostal brothers, ooh, ooh, every, and everyone in between, which is hopefully us, right? We're balanced, right? We always, as Calvary, we're kind of an anomaly, right? To the Baptists, we're Pentecostal. To the Pentecostals, we're Baptists. We don't know what we are. We're just everywhere, right? Everywhere, hopefully, in balance, right? But here's what we should do. We should allow prophecy, we should allow tongues. We should allow interpretation of tongues. We should allow gifts of healing, words of knowledge, words to flow, but in a decent and orderly way. Amen? We shouldn't fight. We shouldn't say, I'm free like a Pentecostal to do whatever, and we shouldn't be so afraid of making a mess that we never risk messing up. And I promise you this, if you come up here and you said, I feel I have a word and you messed up, but you did it sincerely and you're open for correction, it'll be gentle. But if you tell me, Craig, I do not care what the word of God says, the spirit made me do this, then you're going to have a hard day because then I'm going to go, no, you didn't. You know, I'm going to say, sorry, I do not receive you in the name of Jesus. Get out. Right. And I'm gonna, I mean, because, you know, I don't want someone who says, I don't care what the word of God says. I want someone who says, wow, yeah, you know, I didn't see that, or I didn't, yeah, thank you, and they're open, they're humble, amen? The Holy Spirit, hear this, is pictured in the Bible as a calm dove, isn't he? Don't you love that? You ever see a dove? I always love doves, because doves always seem, God puts doves around me to sort of show me how hyper I am. You ever notice that? And I come out of my, they always, he's always, they're always right on my porches. And so like in my office, the other church we were building we had, I'd come out, and the church, and the dove goes away. And the Lord kind of goes, that's how you are with me. You know? <laughs> you know? And so I always see it. Don't you love the dove's mellow? And if you're mellow, the dove just hangs out. My dove would be right next to me, just loves it. And the Lord's like that, right? He wants us to not be hyper. I mean, you know, the, the, the dove is not pictured, or, or the Holy Spirit is not pictured as a hyper hummingbird, right? <laughs> right? He's not like that. You know, that's why I can't drink too much tea because that's, what, you know, and my daughter's even more, right? I mean, Trinity's like crawling up on my head and all that. She's great. And, uh, but here's what I love too. I heard one commentary. The Holy Spirit is not a hawk coming in for the kill, right? The Holy Spirit's not one. The Lord would say to you, you're in sin, brother. And if you don't repent today, you're going to die. How many know that's not the Holy Spirit either? He's not a hawk going, Right, you know, trying to kill you. That's not the way he is. He'll convict you, and he'll sometimes speak hard things to you, but it's not in a way where you're scared or you tinkle a little. That's not God, okay? I want to make sure you're awake, so anyway. An article said 87% of Americans own running shoes. I'm one of them. But the vast majority of people don't run. I mean, I know it's hard to believe I don't run, but I don't. <laughs> he didn't laugh. Thanks a lot. That's not funny. That's like a lot of us. We say we believe in the gifts of the Spirit. We say we believe in praying the Spirit, that it's meant for today. We believe in the validity of prophecy. We say we believe in this. We know the Holy Spirit wants to work wonders in and through us in the congregation. But hear this, guys. Here's the last thing I want to say. We have the running shoes, amen? We have the Holy Spirit. We just need to stop, step out in the Spirit and run, amen? Step out and run. That's what I want you to hear today, is do things decent. The Lord's given us some parameters, but he's saying step out and risk the ocean. Here's what I say every time I'm in this congregation. I say, Lord, if you want to say something through me, I'm open for you to speak, meaning during worship. And that's what I like from you guys, too. And, and just hear this. Hear this. Come to me. I usually right here. Come to me and say, Craig, I really feel I have, a, I have something from God. I have a word. And we'd be welcome to let you do that. Now, hear me. Don't preach a sermon. Don't say, now turn in your Bibles. Just share a simple word. Here's what I feel God is saying to us. And then let the congregation judge it. And how many know, if you've ever given a word, you usually can tell in about three seconds if it's God. Because people go, whoa. Or people go, whoa. 
Right? You know, I, I've given words for people. Whoa, whoa, that was weird. You know, and uh, but you know, but if it's God, you'll see. You'll see the people respond because they hear the Spirit of God speaking through you. Amen. You guys, all right? God's good. So let's do it. Let's pray. Would you stand? Let's pray. I want to pray for you guys. And then we're going to worship. So worship team, come forth. Father God. We thank you for this day, and I thank you for everyone here. And I just ask that right now, just lift your hands if you can. We just surrender ourselves to you, Lord. We don't want to go beyond you, and we don't want to shrink back from you. We just want to not resist you. We just say, Lord, whatever you have for us, we open our hearts to it. Amen? Amen. Bless your people, Lord. Fill them with your Holy Spirit. Give them liberty. Give them, let them hear that said, the proverb about the oxen. And let them say, Lord, I'm willing to make a mess for you if that's what you want. But I want to learn to do it with less and less mess. But I'm willing to risk because I want to have the joy of being used by you. I want to have the joy of be letting you through me build up and strengthen my brothers and sisters in Christ. Let this be a church that Father is supernaturally natural. That it's not hyper-charismatic, it's not crazy charismatic, but it's also not so afraid of messing up. It never moves in the Spirit. I pray for that balance, Lord. I know only your Holy Spirit. You said, Jesus, it's good that you go away because you said if you'd go away, you would give us the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit would quicken the things you said to us and would lead us into all truth. Lord, lead us into truth. Lead us into balance. And let us be people that hear what your Spirit is saying to us. That if you say, go pray for that person, we'll pray for them. If you say, pray for healing, we'll pray for healing. If you say, hey, I want to speak this to them, we would speak it. And we wouldn't do it in King James. We wouldn't do it in a southern accent. We would just speak it in a supernaturally natural way and let you be the one that confirms your signs and wonders that you confirm your word or truth with signs and wonders following. Lord, let us be desirous of you moving powerfully in our midst to where people say, surely God is in your midst. And where people fall down and they worship God and they surrender to God and they give their lives fully. I bless your people in Jesus' name. I pray that you'll bless them this week. That as they wake up tomorrow, they wouldn't wake up going, oh, another day. They would wake up excited. They'd wake up that they have the Holy Spirit in them, that you live in them, and you're empowering them, not just to survive, but to thrive with you, to have abundant life, to have life and life more abundant. Not just salvation, but abundance in everyday life. Abundant blessing, abundant joy, abundant peace, I just speak that truth, your truth to them in Jesus' name. Bless them in Jesus' name. Amen.